Hey everyone, this is Andrew from Private Investigator Advice, and you have reached the Private Investigator Advice podcast. I feel like I'm leaving you guys a message. Um, anyways, um, this is going to be episode 99, and the topic of this podcast is Private Investigator Employee Salary. How do you live on it? So um, that's going to be the topic. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I just want to let you know this episode is brought to you by Private Investigator Advice. Private Investigator Advice has several and templates for business owners and new private investigators um, who are looking for more information about this industry. Um, so one of the things we have is the retainer agreement. And this is one of those things that everybody should have on hand as a business owner. Um, and uh, it's going to kind of set the the, um, the, the, the landscape of what your expectations are for your client and, uh, what, uh, your client sh should expect from you and, uh, kind of like, you know, the pricing and what you're getting paid for. So there's no surprises, right? Everything's going to be documented. You sign, they sign. It's an important piece of documentation to have. Anyways, we have that. We have the surveillance template, and that's going to um, uh, going to have an example report. It's going to have a, a, a template for you. Um, so you know if if you're you want to jump into this the surveillance industry, um, maybe you're a business owner, you've been doing something else, and now you want to you know dive into surveillance, but you don't know what a surveillance report should look like. I got the example report in there for you and the template, so you know exactly what to expect and a video walkthrough. So I can kind of, I walk you through it, just kind of explaining verbally what, what each all uh, little section is and how, what it, what it means and why it's there. And there's also the intake sheet. Basically it's getting the proper information from your client um, uh, just to make sure, you know, you got the, you know, their information, the important information from them and, you know, your case information and things of that nature. I've bundled this all up into um uh, and a more affordable package. You can buy them individually or you can buy it in the package. Uh, and I've also got a workers' compensation. They call it the AOE COE um, uh, questionnaire, along with the report template and an example report. Actually, I actually think that's a really good deal. It's not in the bundle, but uh, it's there for you also. So uh, if you haven't already um, subscribed to the YouTube channel, do that. If you're watching the video, subscribe to the channel. It's free. Uh, I do reviews, I do tutorials, and I do podcasts. Um, if you are listening on your podcast app, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you know when the next podcast is going to be um, delivered. Or Facebook is always a good thing. Uh, go to the Proud Investigator Advice Facebook page and uh, make sure you follow or uh, like the page. And uh, you know, I share all kinds of stuff on there as well. Okay, wow, that was a long time. All right, so let's get into this topic here. So um, you know, how do you live on a private investigator salary when you're working for an investigation company? So as an employee, um, that was a question that was asked, I think it was last year, um, in a survey that I sent out in a newsletter. And I thought it was a really great question to ask, um, because, you know, some people, um, will find out very quickly that it is very, I mean, it can be difficult to live, uh, off a salary as an employee, and, you know, we've talked about this before and there's various reasons behind it, but, um, I, I wrote this article way back, um, to discuss, you know, or and put some more light on investigator salaries, um, uh, especially that of an employee. So, uh, this is what he, uh, the, um, person actually wrote in the survey it says, it seems like there isn't a lot of income for PIs unless you own, uh, own the company or you're in management with a very large company. How do you live on that income? So, uh, generally speaking, this, this, this comment made by this uh, reader is pretty much spot on. Um, you know, the, the real money isn't being an employee. I mean, technically you could make a lot of money, uh, as an employee, uh, but you have to work ungodly amount of hours to do so. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, if you're going to even make a decent salary, you're going to have to be working in upper management. I mean, almost at the top kind of management, uh, to make, uh, what I would think would be a decent salary. And, and when I, when I, when I think of a decent salary, it's going to vary for everybody personally. Uh, but when I think of that, I think I'm thinking of 65, $75,000 a year. Um, you know, it's just something that's a livable salary, right? Um, and that in some, in some places that isn't even livable. You know, you're probably listening to this and in certain areas are like, yeah, right. Like that's poverty level or something to that effect. You know, maybe if you're living in the Bay Area of California, that's poverty. Uh, but you know, and maybe Texas, you're you know, you're doing great. So, 
anyways, um, you know, with all that being said, um, there just, there just isn't a lot of money for investigators as an employee. Um, and, and the real money is again, in upper management or, uh, being a business owner. So, uh, anyways, uh, so how do you live on a private investigator salary? Um, I believe this is my personal belief and, and you could probably double check this through, um, you know, labor sources uh, and I can't think of the name of it, but, uh, you know, the average salary in different areas basically ranges from, uh, $35,000 to $45,000 a year. And, and there's a lot of variables uh, related to those numbers. And again, they could be even higher than that for, in some areas. But generally speaking, with my experience, my knowledge about the industry and the people that I know in the industry, that's what a lot of people average. Um, like I said, unless they're working an ungodly amount of hours a year um, in this industry. And uh, and that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things incorporated that work has a lot to do. If there's not a lot of work. Um, then it could affect that no matter how much hour, uh, much you're making an hour, you know, it could affect that. Um, so anyways, um, I also believe, uh, that, and, and a lot of the averages that I'm pulling from are from the insurance investigation industry, um, because I believe that they employ the most investigators, generally speaking, um, uh, as employees, right? Prime investigator employees. And so, um, that's where I'm kind of getting a lot of my numbers from. Uh, and from experience, I don't have them. Um, I haven't interviewed every company, but um, anyways, that's that's what I'm getting from from my experience. Um, I've talked about this in the past. You know, uh, when I started as a private investigation employee, um, my salary coming in. Uh, this was um, uh, two thousand about two thousand four. Uh, when I was hired on, it was about fifteen fifty an hour, and actually, I was actually that was the 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 rate they brought in somebody with a little bit of experience that was the like the second tier of a of of their their pay rate at the time um but with that i got the um company cell phone i got the um the video camera the laptop um i think i was paid like uh 28 cents a mile around there it was pretty low it wasn't anywhere close to like the you know the you know, us average or whatever it is. If I worked enough days uh, during the month and had a high enough video percentage, I would receive a bonus that varied from $100 to $500 a month. So my checks varied, um, depending on how much work I had, how well I did on those cases, uh, the, the, uh, video percentage bonus that I would receive. And you had to work, work a certain amount of days, right. To even get that, um, and, um, my, my mileage that would also affect kind of like what I was reimbursed. So my checks and I'm going off of memory here and this has been a long time since th those days, but, uh, my checks varied from about a thousand dollars, uh, a pay period every two weeks to $1,500 and my, uh, mileage, uh, reimbursement, uh, was, was about 250 to $500 every two weeks. Um, depending on how much travel I did in a given period. And if I had a really good month, I would get $100 to a $500 bonus at the end of the month for performance. This was all about really about surveillance when I'm talking about this. Now, there were some bad paycheck weeks, right? Where, where it just wasn't a lot of work or cases just didn't go well or a combination of the both. Uh, and those were lean, scary times for me. Um, and uh, I remember just scraping by constantly on the phone with managers trying to make sure that I got the work. Um, and I always tried to do a good job. So they would give me the work over somebody else at the time. You know, when you're, when you're, uh, in an area with, and I, and I started in California when you're in an area with, you know, 10, 15 other guys, we're all trying to get the work. Um, it could be scary. It could be scary. But, um, uh, anyways, it was, it was a tough, it could be some tough times, but, uh, overall I, I felt like I was able to make a living, uh, uh at that time. So we're 2004. And, uh, anyways, that was kind of what I did at that time. So what is a full-time private investigation employee in 2017 for an insurance investigation company make, right? So I'm going to be pulling off of, uh, some information from a friend of mine who is employed, um, and I have a couple friends employed uh, as employees, and the, those compensation packages vary. But uh, generally speaking, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, think of I'm pointing out one in particular. Um, 
Uh, this friend makes about twenty three to four twenty four dollars an hour for an insurance investigation company. Um, they get a gas card, uh, so the company pays for their gas. Uh, you know, when working, they have health benefits. Uh, they receive uh, a few weeks of vacation a year, uh, and they receive a approximately two hundred fifty dollars a month for vehicle maintenance. Um, and then, you know, this doesn't sound like a great deal of money, um, hourly, but this investigator is a workaholic, um, and works between 50 and 60 hours a week. Um, and, uh, you know, and you incorporate that, incorporate that with, um, um, uh, uh, overtime and things like that. Uh, they take home, uh, around 2000 to $2,300, uh, every two weeks, which isn't too shabby. That's actually pretty decent. But again, a lot of work goes involved with that and a lot of sacrifice in other areas. Um, but, you know, working like that isn't for everybody. This one per particular investigator uh, is just crazy, crazy um, hardworking and um, uh, sacrifices a lot to, to to make those kind of hours happen. One thing that I've noticed in this industry, in the insurance investigation industry, is that insurance investigation companies are willing to pay a little bit more now than they did even six years ago. Um, you know, when uh, when when it's really, and this really kind of depends on their infrastructure and their company. Do they have a training program, things like that? If they don't have a training program, uh, a program that is uh, there to uh, get someone started from nowhere, like not knowing anything about being a PI to, you know, usable, uh, then they can be a little more picky when, um, getting started, but it's also very expensive to do that. And I've talked to you guys about this before, so you probably heard me say this. Um, but if there are, they don't have that infrastructure built in, then, uh, the, uh, other invest, you know, the investigator who with experience has a little more leverage and I've seen them starting to pay more for the experienced investigator, which I think is wonderful. I mean, um, I'm all about, you know, the investigator, uh, getting paid what they're worth. I really am. Um, I mean, there's some expectations that come along with being an employee, uh, but generally speaking, uh, you know, um, you know, when you can get, you know, more than $24 an hour, you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape in this industry. I'm not pretty good shape, but I mean, you're, you're probably above average in this industry, uh, pay wise. So anyways, I've started to notice that it's a great trend I'm seeing. I know that these companies, uh, have the money to pay that it just, you know, makes their, um, profit margin a little thinner. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. I, I think, uh, personally, I think the investigator has been getting taken advantage of quite a bit over the past, I don't know, you know, 15 years, at least that I've been in the industry. So, um, anyways, uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for the increase. Like I've, uh, the ones I've mentioned, uh, but we'll get into that another day. So the next area of this podcast is how do you live on a private investigator salary? Like uh, as an employee, so I'll just kind of explain my situation. So in my early years as a private investigator, um, my wife and I, uh, we didn't have any bills. I mean, no like major bills. Uh, it was just like living expenses, you know, food, gas, electric, water, garbage, whatever it was. We lived in an apartment uh, in California and uh, I, all of our vehicles were paid for. Um, so we didn't have car payments. You know, we had car insurance. Um, and, you know, and I became a private investigator like, I think within like, I don't know, six months of being married. Um, and so it wasn't too bad at that time. Uh, my wife and I both, you know, we worked full, full time. My wife um, wasn't making that much money. Or I think our rent was like, I want to say $960 a month in 2004, I think it was. Um, I think my wife made like 13 or $14 an hour. Um, and, uh, when work was slow, we had already put some money away. It was just me and my wife. We didn't have any kids, right? It was just me and her working full time. Um, and so when, when work was slow for me, uh, we still had enough money to pay, pay our bills and we still, you know, we saved and lived comfortably. Um, and even when I didn't have a consistent paycheck, we were still okay in those seasons, uh, because my wife was, uh, you know, even though she was only making thirteen or fourteen dollars an hour, she was still working consistently. So, um, for us, it was it was it wasn't too bad early on. Everybody's situation is different, um, but um, 
what I would say is it's always helpful to save for the you know the times when work is slow. And there's a lot of industries like this. Um, and and P, being a prime investigator is one of those, whether you're a business owner or whether you're an employee. Um, so uh, as a married uh, young married couple, uh, and that was early on in this industry, that's basically what we did. So that was us. That was that was our financial situation early on uh, as an employee, as I was an employee for an investigation company. But uh, you know, you can be like my friend um, who works. Well, I I did work a lot early on in my career. Uh, you know, a lot of hours. Um, just kind of what you did because you're kind of trying to learn and everything. And uh, and again, you don't know when the next case is going to come or how each case is going to go. Um, but um, I don't do that as much now. I don't put in 50 hours, 60 hour weeks, but my friend does. Uh, and, uh, and consistently, like I mentioned earlier to you. And, um, you know, you can try to work as many hours as my friend does to elevate your, you know, your salary as employee, a salary as an employee. And you would have a livable salary if everything worked out well, where, you know, you get the 50 or 60 hours um, and thing, you know, your surveillances go well. Maybe you're incorporating some, you know, SIU work or in, in statements and scene investigations and things like that. Maybe you're mixing that all together and you're getting the 50 or 60 hours. And, and maybe that's including report time and stuff like that. Um, and, and you got to understand that uh, this, this friend of mine um, is a very good saver, very good with their money. Um, so th- when they make that much money and they're, they're still saving for those rainy days where it's slow, um, and, uh, and they know the importance of saving for those slow seasons on a personal note, this is my opinion on this. Cause I've been doing this for so long and, and I know the ramifications, uh, for people with families and stuff like that. Um, this has been my experience and, and I've noticed this with other families as well. I don't think working 60 hours a week is living. Um, this is, this is my opinion. Um, you know, you can make a great living working 60 hours a week. Um, but you're sacrificing a lot, um, for that. Um, um, and, and I just, I don't look at life as being consumed with work and living for work. I mean, we work to live. Um, and so, um, anyways, I've talked about that in the past about, you know, um, you know, turning down certain things, uh, turn, turn down certain jobs because, um, it wasn't going to be a good fit for my family situation. So, um, yeah, that's just my personal opinion on, on the 50 to 60 hour weeks. I just, it, you know, everybody's different. Everybody's going to have different opinions. Everybody's going to have a different family situation, things like that. And I totally understand that. But, um, uh, being an employee working 60 hours a week is tough. So anyways, let's move on here. Okay, so I, here's what I want you to do. I, 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 whether you're, you're new to this industry, whether you're still in this industry, whether you're an employee, where you're a business owner, I really want you to wrap your head around this if you're not already wrapped around it. So I don't want you to fit this industry into a box. I don't want you to put, you know, you're either a, an employee or you're a business owner. That's nonsense. Don't think of it like that. You know, you, well, you can be an investigator where you're getting, you're, you're diversifying where your money's coming from. Okay, you could be a business owner and you uh, full time, and maybe you work part time for uh, a company, right? Just to make sure you got some work coming in, or vice versa. Maybe you know you work uh, part time both, and vice versa. Maybe you're just maybe you work part time for a company, maybe you work part time for yourself, and with that, you know maybe a decent income comes out of that for you. Um, having a diverse you know income uh, can be the difference between paying your bills. And, and uh, each month are being broke. Um, and um, I think working for yourself um, can add a major, you know, working for yourself, you can make twice as much, maybe three times as much as you can working for a company. So you don't have to work as much, right? Um, if you're working uh, for a company making $25 an hour and you work for yourself making $75 an hour, I think you can do the math and realize how much you have to work to make a certain amount, you know, as you would uh, as an employee. So I want you to really think about that. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You could you could be process serving. You could be you know uh, doing this and doing that and side hustle. It, it, all these different things could add up to a really decent income without killing yourself working 60, 70 hours or something crazy like that. Um, I, I, I you guys can obviously do whatever you want, right? And if you're very happy and it's very um, it, it's easy to be an employee and it's not. Um, 
not as stressful. And I totally get that. I totally get that. I still work part time for companies. It's I'm not I don't care. It's it's, it fits in my family situation. Um, I'm able to, uh, you know, work it out to where I get to make all the, you know, events with my family, take vacation whenever I want to. This works for me being part time doing my own business, and sometimes working for other companies or subcontracting or whatever. Um, This works for me. And and that might work for you. But I, I if you're if you're listening to this and you're an employee, look into starting your own business. It's not that intimidating. Just start it. It doesn't have to, nothing has to magically happen and no one's judging you based on how much work you get. Start the business, get the business license, get the, you know, the agency license for your company, um, get the insurance and it's going to allow more doors to be open for you. Um, it's going to allow more opportunities from income. And once you get a taste of what it's like to make twice as much for your own business versus working for somebody else, you're going to catch that bug. You're going to be like, what am I doing? Like, no, I could be making so much more money and spending more, so much more time with my family or so much more time with my spouse. Um, you know, and it's maybe someday you won't need to be an employee any longer. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you just don't do that at all. So, you know, it's up to you. It's up to you. I, I, I mean, I, that my experience as, as an employee, um, unless you're, like I said, unless you're, you're working crazy hours, you're not going to get that big income, but you don't have to work crazy hours um, necessarily as a business owner. Every, every, you know, situation is different. I always have to clarify that, but just generally speaking, you know, you can make a pretty decent living just working for yourself. If you, you know, if you, if you market yourself enough, if you make good connections, if you have a good reputation in the industry, um, even subcontracting for companies, you can make a decent living. Um, as long as it's consistent, of course. So anyways, I, I talk a lot about, uh, these types of things. Uh, I'm going to put plenty of links, uh, to kind of guide you to maybe starting your own business or some of the expenses. That was always a big one. How much was, how much did it cost to become a prime investigator, uh, or have a prime investigation business? Um, I'll link to that in the, hopefully in the podcast notes, in the video notes, definitely check, take a, take a look at that, check it out. Um, with that being said, guys, um, that's it, guys. Uh, if you have questions about this, feel free to email me. Um, uh, I think it's piadvicehq at gmail.com. Um, other than that, thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. And um, I hope you got something from it. Be sure to check out the templates um, and subscribe to the podcast, the video, the Facebook page, whatever whatever you your fancy is. Subscribe to that so you can keep in touch. And um, and, and see the next things that come out in the future. All right, guys, that's it. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day. Bye. Mm-hmm.